Hi, everyone, and thanks, Mario, for the great uh, presentation. It's a perfect lead into uh, the presentation here, which is a, a CTN response to COVID vaccination and trying to understand all these complicated issues uh, related to immune response. Um, so this is the immunogenicity outcomes in people living with HIV study, so CTN328. Um, and many, many people I'll say were involved and are involved in this study. Uh, it's being led by Curtis and I, and uh, Aslam was uh, the representative on behalf of the CTN. Um, so yeah, so this is my uh, conflict of interest slide. Um, so basically the purpose of this brief talk is just to understand some current gaps in knowledge regarding immunogenicity outcomes, which I don't really need to cover because Mario did a great job um, and describe the study design for what we're planning to do with the CTN 328. Um, so just a background, um, uh, most people may know, but people with HIV tend to have poor antibody responses when they're vaccinated for influenza, pneumococcal, meningitis, hepatitis A and hepatitis B. And this is especially the case when people have a low CD4 count. So the literature tends to quote 200 uh, cells or less, or when they're actively viremic. Um, and uh, so this is the reason why sometimes we have to give double doses of vaccines to people with HIV or we have to give uh, boosters. Um, as we know, there's intersecting vulnerabilities which put people at risk of um, uh, uh, catching a, uh, COVID or having worse outcomes. And the issue with the clinical trials that uh, Mario had mentioned is that many of them recruited patients with CD4 cells over 500 and not too many comorbidities. So this really um, eliminates a big uh, segment of the Canadian population with HIV. And in the primary publications from Pfizer and Moderna, those data for HIV patients were not included. And the data, to my knowledge, is still not available for people with HIV. And so we felt that these data were not generalizable to the broader spectrum of people with HIV in Canada. So this was the reason why we thought we should design a study to look at immunogenicity, but in the broader spectrum of people with HIV, and to also look at durability, because even if people do mount a response, will it even, if it is as satisfactory, will it last long enough? And then we wanted to see as well, uh, I guess, effectiveness, although I won't go into that because that's uh, more in Burkle's uh, um, study. So we think that people with HIV probably do uh, produce a lesser immune response to COVID vaccine than people without HIV. And just globally speaking, the goals of this study will be to inform vaccination guidelines and of course reduce morbidity and mortality. So the primary objective uh, for the study will be to look at the percentage of people with HIV enrolled who develop COVID-19 specific antibodies at six months after vaccination. And we did debate about that definition, but uh, in the end, we decided to go with the six month mark, recognizing of course, this is somewhat arbitrary and some may argue three months is a better time point. However, this is so uh, kind of what we decided upon. And, uh, and then our secondary outcomes were, you know, neutralization capacity, durability at 12 months. And then we wanted to examine as well how um, proportions and activation status of the different uh, lymphocytes and so forth change pre and post vaccine. And of course, to do cytokine profiling. Uh, we also wanted to, to look at safety and tolerability based on both local and systemic adverse effects. Um, and then because of our sample size, um, we set as exploratory objectives to look at people with HIV, but specific subsets of people, such as those with CD4 counts under 350 or immune non-responders, people who are obese, women, and smokers. And then, of course, um, there's going to be an objective, as you'll see, uh, with, uh, to look at um, antibodies uh, cross-reactive to, to variants. 
So this is actually an observational cohort study. So this means uh, the CTN will not be giving vaccine to anyone. It, people will be eligible for vaccination and will be going kind of based on their own discussions with their doctor and their provinces as the vaccine is available. But um, if people are interested, they could then sign up for this uh, study. So based on our sample size calculations, which I'll get to, this would include 200 people with HIV and 50 HIV negative controls. And we, we are going to aim to recruit from four sites uh, in Canada. So the four, uh, four of the big CTN sites and each site will also attempt to recruit some HIV negative participants. So uh, in order to make up the sample size, we, much uh, we have to thank Joel Singer, who went to the effort of doing all the calculations involved. And um, we set an 80% power and um, to detect a 20% difference. So we made the assumptions that 90% of people uh, who do not have HIV will mount an adequate IgG response. And that data is you know, from Pfizer and Moderna and so forth. And then based on the literature of how people with HIV um, respond to other vaccines, we estimated that about 70% of people with HIV may mount a response. So again, with statistics, these are based on certain assumptions. Um, and we did have to uh, commit to uh, the outcome of interest. So we decided to put a, full, a four fold rise in IgG levels at six months as our uh, primary endpoint. And again, this is arbitrary, but um, uh, these are what the decisions were. So the nice thing about this study is it's one of the rare studies where pretty much everybody is welcome. So if you have HIV infection um, and you're going to be getting the COVID vaccine, you are eligible to be in this study. Um, you're also eligible if you don't have HIV and you're also going to get the vaccine. Uh, the age cutoff is 16. Um, and in terms of exclusion criteria, it's just certain exclusion criteria like receipt of a blood product or immunoglobulin preparation in less than a month of receiving the vaccine or active COVID uh, infection. And uh, it's no problem if people receive other vaccines, such as for influenza and so forth, but we will record that. And, and we do expect most people will have suppressed viral loads on heart, although if someone has a blip or two, it's, it's not a problem. Um, so this is the study schedule. So you can see there's uh, going to be five visits. So the first one's a screening visit, and we're going to allow people to do the screening visit up to three months before actually getting the vaccine. And then we do the standard things, full medical history, medication history. Um, we're going to administer the CITF symptoms questionnaire, and that stands for um, Canadian Immunology Task Force Questionnaire. Um, and, and then they get the vaccine and then we'll do follow up visits um, uh, about a month after that dose. And if people do get a second uh, dose of vaccine, we'll schedule a, a visit if possible one a month after the second dose of vaccines, which would be roughly three months in the context of the whole study, as well as six and 12 months post second vaccine. Um, and again, these are these endpoints are debatable a lot. And, and with the group, we did discuss these at detail. And we, we tried to go with the CITF recommendations with the hope, of course, that they'll decide to fund the, the study. So uh, these measures, I won't go into too much detail because Mario did a great job. But um, uh, uh, Marc-Andre Langua of Ottawa is going to measure these. And him and uh, Dr. Jane Graf from Toronto use the same uh, the, the same reagents and tools. So it's nice because then we can compare results. Um, and what's important to know is that th these technologies can distinguish vaccine induced immunity from natural uh, infection induced immunity. And then uh, with our colleague Mark Brockman and Sabrina Brume in uh, Vancouver, we're going to look or in in Simon Fraser, uh, um, they're going to do some studies to see uh, cross recognition of variants of concern and the 
the percentage of people who harbor those. And neutralization assays will also be done by Marc Andre. Um, in terms of cellular immunity, Dr. Janabian at UCAM will be doing some cellular phenotyping. And with these, we're going to do all the markers of, you know, senescence and activations so we could compare pre and post what's going on. Uh, Mario uh, in Toronto and Mark uh, Brockman again will look at uh, COVID specific T cell responses. Um, Mark and I believe Zabrina will be doing single cell sequencing of PBMCs pre and post, and then uh, my group will be doing some cytokine profiling. Um, so of course, we're also going to collect data on safety and tolerability. We really do expect that this will be very safe, um, but it's always good to document that. Um, and in terms of tolerability, like we expect you'll be well tolerated. But we're, we also want to document this systematically because we, we can't make these assumptions. So people will have a symptom diary and we'll look at local reactions. So redness, pain or swelling at the injection site, seven and 30 days post injection. And these are directly taken from the Pfizer protocol and the systemic reactions, you know, headache, muscle pain, joint pain, fever, diarrhea, again, seven and 30 days post each injection. Um, and then we're going to do the questionnaire items on COVID and people will be trained to know what are the signs and symptoms of COVID-19, although I think by now we probably all know them, but people will be reminded. Um, and they will be asked to report uh, to the study coordinator if they develop any of these signs or symptoms even uh, after 14 days, because this could represent you know, a variant of concern. And if that is the case, we will confirm this with a PCR-based test. And even if this is done by saliva, um, what's interesting is um, it's still possible to uh, check for variants of concern and to, to do, um, you know, some immunoglobulin levels. Um, so this is what the poster looks like. So thanks to Sean and the communications team. So there's a poster deve developed for people living with HIV who might want to participate, as well as for people who are HIV negative um, controls. And we're going to put these up at the sites and we're going to get uh, ethics approval to put them up on social media. So a person does not even need to be followed at the specific clinic. You know, for example, in Toronto, it could be someone, say, from the Maple Leaf who is referred to, you know, the uh, UHN where Sharon will be enrolling patients and they can participate or someone you know at the Oak Tree Clinic in Vancouver might be interested and they would be referred to you know Mark Hull's team at um, St. Paul's and they could participate. So you don't need to be followed there. Um, another good thing we're doing as an incentive and this was Marie, uh, Zabrina's idea is to provide the antibody result to patients at the end uh, because that is a real motivator for many people it seems is to know actually what their own antibody levels were. Um, so for acknowledgements, there's just been so many people involved. It's been really incredible. The CTN head office did a wonderful team, especially Eva, who helped us put in our application and really just everyone there. The scientific review and the CAC committee did a very speedy job. And of course, uh, Curtis and Anne from the co-infection core was very helpful as well. And of course, we're very grateful to Marc Andre, who's going to be uh, managing all the uh, serology and neutralization data for us.